I am going to try to uh, moderate a discussion, which will be interesting with only one microphone. Um, but I thought I would say one word first about what we're hoping that you're getting out of this session, which is that you, we're hoping you get some idea that there are two very dissimilar cultures at work here between the journalistic culture and the scientific culture. Someone once said that uh, the typical scientist is obsessive compulsive personality. And of course that's not true of anybody in this room, but you may know people who fit that pattern. I think it's fair to say that the typical journalist, however, is attention deficit disorder <laughs> personality, right? They actually don't manage to focus on anything longer than, you know, a couple of days maximum or a couple of hours in some people's. So it means that there's two universes running around here and they collide, but where the collision takes place, sometimes there's a lot of miscommunication. I'm going to recommend two books to you if you really want to read about the two cultures. Both came out last year. This is by the former editor of Science Times in the New York Times, the section that appears every Tuesday, uh, Cornelia Dean. This is by a Canadian here, believe it or not, who spent most of her time working in, uh, in the United States, Nancy Barton. If you, Baron, if you only buy one, buy this one. I hope I get some, I hope I get some money for, for saying this, but you really should have both, right? You know, Am I Making Myself Clear, A Scientist's Guide to Talking to the Public? by uh, Cornelia Dean, which I think is uh, Harvard, I can't remember, Harvard, right? Or uh, Escape from the Ivory Tower, A Guide to Making Your Science Matter by Nancy Barron, B-A-R-O-N from Island Press. Both good, I think this one fits better because they're actually Canadian examples in this one, There's many, many Canadian examples in this one. Um, and one of the points that uh, one of them makes, I can't now remember, is to run through the cultural differences between uh, scientists and, uh, and journalists. And I'll say only this word and then we'll go on to the panel discussion. So science, science, and science and journalism. Science is slow and ongoing. Journalism is deadline driven. You must have got that out of this discussion so far, right? Deadline, deadline, deadline. Science, they want evidence first. Actually, you may not get this point, what journalists want is the conclusion first. When they're looking at a scientific paper, they read the headline, the abstract, and the conclusion. They don't read all that boring stuff in the middle. They may go back if they need a specific question, but they want to know, in other words, what they're really saying is tell me what you found, not how you found it. Maybe that, that comes later, but tell me what you found, not how you found it. Science is in-depth, and Lord God, we know that for sure. We are superficial, I'm sorry. We are the quick overview, wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, we're out of here, right, you know? There are a couple of exceptions, right, you know, do an hour-long documentary, but by and large, that's not us. Because we're not trying to tell the whole story. We're just giving you one tiny little bit of installment, and then we'll, you know, more will happen later. Scientists deal with love, revel in, and are very aware of uncertainty, right? That's it, uncertainty. There's caveats, there's always more to know. We want it all cut and dried. We want to know, is this gonna kill you? You know, is this a toxin? Will all these nanoparticles start replicating amongst themselves, right? We want a certainty about all this, right? Scientists are specific about things, you know, they'll give you a specific example, they'll even name the species, right? We just want to know, do all ants do this? Do all barnacles have penises four times as long as their bodies? Not which particular barnacle has it. Generalization is what journalism is about. Scientists are interested in other people's credentials, you know? Where do they do their postdoc? Who do they did their PhD with? Where do they publish? How, how, how highly cited are they? We're interested in the way that people look at the world, what their take is on things. I don't really care. I don't really care whether you went to Harvard or Podunk University. It doesn't matter to us. And finally, and this should also be obvious from the discussion, scientists are rational. Maybe not about, you know, 
taxes or via rail or anything else, but they're rational about science, where journalists and journalism is largely emotional. I mean, it deals with emotions. We want to tell a story that touches people. You said entertainment, but it's really touching people, getting to them and awakening things in them. And that's what I hope, some of what I hope, anyhow, that you took out of some of this discussion. Now, I'm going to shut up and see if people have some... But first place, do any of the, any of the three presenters want to comment on each other's presentation? To say anything? No? You're, you're getting papers ready? I just wanted to read this out. This, someone just sent this to me this week. Uh, this came from one of my favorite science bloggers who wrote the ultimate science headline, which is, Revolutionary Breakthrough Described as Missing Link Between the Magic Bullet and the Holy Grail. <laughs> So to cover, that covers the whole waterfront, doesn't it? Yes, we've got it all there. Okay, that's the only comment, one, one on another? Okay, I'd like some feedback, please, from anybody here. We had one question about, dead, about uh, email. Yes, sir? Uh, yeah, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Are these the, the new media, the social media, how do they matter, right? And how do we use them as scientists to communicate with you? And uh, I'm just, uh, I want to talk about science bloggers because I think that's been the most significant change in both science and science journalism that I've seen in the past five years. Um, I get an incredible number of stories now, not from uh, the embargo system, and not from my mainstream media colleagues, but from science bloggers, who are scientists who are writing blogs about interesting research in their field. From a scientist's perspective, they're writing it largely in layman's terms. There's a couple that are just outstanding. Ed Young, who writes not exactly rocket science, is my absolute favorite. He actually gave me that quote. Um, and I think that this is the most significant change in how scientists are engaging with the public. Writing about their own work for the public on their own blogs, writing about his colleagues' research. And it also, I can talk about this later, or you talk to you about the break, it's actually changing, I think, peer review in some ways. Um, I don't know how many of you were aware of the incredible controversy that erupted on the blogosphere uh, over the arsenic bacteria paper that was released, a uh, paper from some American scientists working um, for the NASA astrobiology program. They claimed to have found uh, arsenic that had incorporated, uh, found bacteria that had incorporated arsenic into its DNA. Big paper, NASA press conference, huge, huge, uh, play in the press, and a microbiologist from UBC on her own blog tore the paper apart, quite viciously I think, but ripped it apart, said it was terrible science, should never have been published, was hyped like mad, and other scientists on their blogs all jumped in, attacked the paper, supported the paper, and suddenly we had post-publication peer review instead of pre-publication peer review, and I think it's one of the most significant changes I've seen. And I think it's a change that's great for science and great for journalism. Does that answer your question? The environmental health perspectives also does post-publication peer review on, on environmental, especially on tox, toxicology, but on all environmental health type stories. Yes? In, in terms of a, of a daily news cycle, uh, first of all, it, it's going to mean a lot less for the daily news uh, because we're probably not looking on Facebook to get our contacts. First of all, our story probably came from the assignment editor's buddy who was listening to Quarks and Quarks and told him about it, so now we're following up on it. Uh, Facebook won't actually impact the daily news cycle yet. How it's going to all shake down is anybody's guess. But right at the moment, no, they're not paying a lot of attention. So they'll, they'll get on Facebook and ask for help. Do you know anybody who, blah, blah, blah. But in terms of input from Facebook, not a lot. But there's another side to your question, it was all the social media, is it a way for you to get things out without going through the media, right? You know, just bypass all these old guys over here, right? Um, and the answer is yes, but you only get to people who are interested in your subject, right? So in other words, if you're interested in what the National Science Foundation estimates at 20% of the public, what they call the science attentive public, and you're only interested in that 20%, and you don't give a darn about the other 80% out there, 
then social media are a great thing because people will go looking for things there. But if you want to get people who are peeling the potatoes at home, right, and aren't looking for this, or are listening to quirks on their on the iPod, the podcast, because they downloaded it and listening to it, or reading the United Church Observer or anything else, they're not looking for a science thing, then you, the mass media are still the place you have to go. You can't reach that 80 percent on the blogosphere because they're not looking on the blogosphere yet. Penny, did you did you have a thought about that? All right, but Penny, did you have a thought about that? Well, I did. Because Better stand up because okay. I've got a microphone and you haven't. So uh, actually, I think increasingly journalists are looking to Twitter and that sort of thing before their toes even hit the floor when they're getting out of bed. They're checking on their iPhones, their library to see who they follow, what they're talking about. And actually, if you think about it, the arsenic story was really interesting because NASA was holding an embargoed press conference before the paper was released. And on Monday, already in the Twitter <coughs> sphere, some people were talking about it saying, what do you think? Is this, have they found alien life? Because there was a huge kerfuffle about what was, how actually NASA was spinning this information. And Scientific American was on there saying, uh, it's not what you think it is, I've seen it, nobody wants to break the embargo, but there was this whole back chat that was going on on, the, on Twitter about what this, what was coming in. So I would say that, <coughs> editors are more likely to be um, watching and checking to see what's happening and what is in the zeitgeist for that day so that they know how to respond. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. You can use social media to get to the media who then get to the 80%. You just can't use the social media to get to the 80% because they're not looking at it. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question coming further on this. What is the, the main source of your stories I guess you were coming how you decide on the main story? Just something that you know, someone you know and tells you something and then you follow that through or asking anyone in particular yeah. or everyone? Yeah. 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 I'll go first, I think everyone does it differently. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Since we're on every week, the main focus of our show are the major papers published in the peer reviewed journals. We, we only do peer reviewed science on our show. We, we could do ongoing science, we could do it differently. We, we just decided on our show we're because we're not scientists, I should point that out on Quirks and Quarks, none of us are scientists, including our host, we're journalists. So I can't do peer review. I can't tell whether your science is valid or not. So we do sort of rely on peer review to give us some kind of guidance that you're, what you're doing at least has some validity. So we go through the, the main journals every week. Um, so that's source number one. I mentioned blogs from other scientists, particularly if you're in some you know, small uh, journal we can't read them all. So, you know, we look at science and nature and PNAS and physics review letters and, and you know, Royal Society, but there's millions of journals. So, um, so we rely on people telling us. Uh, a lot of scientists write to us directly, most, mostly Canadian scientists who write and say, I've got a small, you know, pre-printed archive, which I would never know about, and it's really cool. And, uh, and finally, uh, this has been happening more and more. We get a lot of emails from proud parents saying, my son <laughs> is a postdoc in Norway, and he's actually Canadian, and he's got a really cool paper, and nine times out of 10, it's actually a real cool paper. We would never know he's Canadian because he's at the University of Norway. He's in some obscure European journal, and he's done some real great work, usually on animal sex. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, as a freelancer, um, writing predominantly for print and web, uh, I have a slightly different uh, bent on it. Um, I'm not really doing a lot of hard hitting, this is what science published today. I'm looking at topics that are more evergreen, that are more feature driven, that are more about the pursuit of science, the personalities of science, that sort of thing. I'll give you an example. I wrote a story for innovationcanada.ca, which is the Canada Foundation for Innovation's website, um, about uh, an astronomer at the University of Winnipeg. Okay? Interesting research. What really got me was when I looked at her website and I looked at uh, what she was saying about it, she was a pre-med student in Lebanon 10 years ago. How the heck do you go from pre-med Lebanon to University of Winnipeg astronomy? 
That was what I thought was really cool. I wanted to chart that path, and I wanted to tell that story. Um, and so what I would say is for your website, for your blog, for whatever information you have coming out to the media or that you think the media might touch on, um, if you've got some <coughs> juicy little tidbit that'll make a feature story, include it. You know, if your nanotech research happens to be on hockey sticks, or one out of one possible solution for it could be used in hockey sticks to make them that much stronger. And gosh, we live in Canada and the playoffs are coming. Do I need to spell it out? Like, that's a great story and it will be jumped over like crazy. So, so think about the, the juicy morsel that you can work into beyond just the science. Well. For the last four years I've worked, I've had the opportunity to work on, on Daily Planet on the Discovery Channel. And the, the trajectory, story trajectory is, is not quite as in-depth as quirks and quirks, but very similar. And you're, you're, you're looking through the journals, you're looking through your contacts and your phone calls and, and tweets and what have you, not so much tweets, frankly, you phone. But yeah, you're, you're, you're looking specifically for science stories. Now, four years ago, uh, I've spent uh, 15 years with, with Global News. My wife, by the way, will not watch the news with me anymore because I yell and scream at the TV. So let me, let me ask you, when was the last time you saw a science story on an evening newscast? If any of you watch evening news. When was the last time you saw a science story on an evening news? Can you even pull even one out of the air? Neither can I. Uh, science is not high on the list of stories that they want to cover or will assign, as I said, 1992, thereabouts, they yanked science reporting right out of the budget. Forget it, it's not going to happen anymore. We'll steal from Quirks and Quarks if it's a particularly compelling story. And by the way, it has some good pictures too. We'll steal from Grain, same deal, same criteria. But, and I say we, I haven't been in it in four years. News editors, news assignment editors, reporters, we'll get it, we'll get it from the paper We'll get it that day. More than likely, if it's appeared in the paper, it's a good science story, it's about animal sex, we'll do it. And it's got pictures. Um, I'll just mention one more source, actually, I should, I should have mentioned that it's actually quite important, is we do get uh, press releases from the universities directly. And um, the good universities know what we want, and they don't snow us with every thing that's going on. They know what works on works, and they'll contact us directly. So if you've got, and I know you all have outreach people or public information officers that you work with, um, you know, use them. They should have the contacts. They will help you get your paper out or your, your message out. Um, that's quite valuable as well. I've got a question over here, but just to answer Rob's point, in fact, CBC The National did do a piece, uh, I believe it was last week, on exoplanets out of the... Kepler? Was it the Kepler mission? Kepler yeah, mission? Yeah, again, they're yanking that right out of Quirks and Quarks. I mean, they're taking that no, it was before Quirks. And, it was before Quirks and Quarks. And in fact, but they used they used the same talent. They had Bob McDonald illustrating it using a light bulb. I love it. So the commenting on the paper, absolutely ask for a copy. Even if it's under embargo, the journalist has received it under embargo. They'll always uh, send you a PDF if you agree to respect the embargo as well. So. My advice, don't comment on a paper you haven't read, that would be crazy. Um, if he says, you know, I'll call you back in half an hour and that's not enough time, tell him you're not ready yet. I mean, you know, you set the agenda here. You don't have to comment. So you're in control, you set the agenda, get the paper, take as much time as you want. That would be my advice. The second more difficult situation is when a news person, like Rob, calls you up and says, I'm on deadline. I'm doing a story on um, the dangers of nanotech and gray goo. What do you think? Right? You're not expecting the call. You work vaguely in the area of nanotech. You're not exactly sure what story he's doing. You're not sure what his, his um, agenda or angle is. In that case, ask who he is, get a phone number, find out who he's writing the story for, ask him what his approach or focus is, Ask him specifically what you want to comment on, and then tell him you've got someone in your office and you'll call him back in 10 minutes. Really valuable. Don't get rushed into commenting if you're not ready to comment. No harm in saying, call you back in 10 minutes, think about what you want to say. Wow, that gets responsive. <laughs>
Well, I, I just want to make a couple of comments. Um, so, so one is, uh, so there's a bunch of people in the audience here that are the support for a lot of communication. So perfect example, I'd be one for Win, where I'm already preparing for Dr. Cardi. He's got a, got a call come in, I'll take it, do a little bit of prep, and he'll probably get the interview on Thursday. So there is a group in here that you should probably meet over, uh, over drinks or so. Um, there's also, at some point here, I wanted to point out, there are a number of people who are from uh, Communications and Public Affairs and Office of Research, and I think they're going to be on after the break, but somehow maybe single them out because we made the comment about there are those channels and outputs, and those people already have those that they're asking about how do you get out uh, an outbound call. They are here in the Let me also point out that journalists are phoning up people for, for their opinion about published research for two reasons. First, as a, as a filter, as a screen. You know, is this stuff really important? I mean, when I, for 10 years, I did this job for the largest newspaper in Canada, somewhat similar to what Quirks did. My job at the Star, for which they paid me inordinately well, was not to write about things. My job at the Star was to tell them what things weren't worth putting in the paper. There's no shortage of stuff to put in the paper or put on the air. Your real job is to be able to distinguish the wheat and the chaff. Of course, we don't know, we're not scientists, as, as has been pointed out. So you go to other people and say, look, this paper has just been published. Is it, you know, it's being promoted by PNAS or somebody as an important paper, but give me your take on it. And, you know, two thirds of the time, that's where it ends, basically, that's where it ends. Then you have the other situation where you have got uh, something that you think you're going to write about for various reasons. And what you're looking for, what I was looking for there, I don't want to make any statements for anybody else, was what we call a validator in my line of work. In other words, of course the principal author of the paper is going to say this is the greatest discovery ever since Kepler, right? I mean, come on. This is my paper. I've sweated blood for it. I finally got a paper in nature or science. I'm going to tell you how wonderful it is. My editors, you know, not being born yesterday and in fact being maybe not as bad as, news, as TV assignment people, but just about as bad as TV assignment people, are going to say, horse feathers. Why does that, you know, how, why should we pay any attention to this guy or this woman blowing their own horn? So what you want is somebody else, preferably a Nobel laureate, if you can get one, or at least someone from, you know, with, with, with some, some, some with a title, Canada Research Chair is great. Now we're shooting for Canada Excellence Research Chairs, right? They've upped the game. We want C. We want CERCs now, we not just. We've got 19 of them. You know, we've got 19 of them. So, so, to say yes, this is an important piece of research, and then boom! Instead of being on page A22, I might actually be on page A3 or A1. That's the other reason, Graham. Yeah, I just want to make one small point, which is when I was talking about knowing your enemies, I, I actually literally meant that. If, if you have an enemy, someone who passionately disagrees with you, it pays to know that person. Because when your article comes out, who are they going to call? That guy. Because he's passionately disagreeing with you. So if you know that someone disagrees with you, it might be worth knowing them. Not liking their research, not agreeing with their research, but at least knowing them so that when you get a call that says, you know, what do you think of this paper? You can at least know that the other guy is giving you the fair side of judgment and not just saying, ah, it sucks, or it's junk, or whatever. You know, know your, have a network of people that disagree with you so that you can know their work and when you get called up all of a sudden, what do you think of this paper? You actually know the person, know their research, and you can give insight to it so you're not caught on the spot. Jim? Um, the most common quote I see in, in newspaper articles or magazine articles on some research, where they go to the validator. The validator is someone in the same field who was not associated with the paper. The most common quote you see is, well, if it pans out and turns out to be true, it would be quite significant. <laughs> Which means I think it's bullshit. <laughs> Other questions, comments, observations? Yes. So, Rob, you said 95% of the time you're not trying to <laughs> manipulate their we are not trying to put wrong information. Nobody likes to put wrong information out there in the public. Do we get it wrong? Yeah, I'm sorry to say we do every now and then. What about the, 90, what about the other 5%? Okay, I, I can't talk to them. 
I mean, there's, there's, there's jerks out there. There's people oh, okay. that, that will that, that have an agenda. That, that okay. have the agenda. They have it. They, they, it's true. You get it from the assignment editor, and it's happened to me. You get an assignment editor. I'm sorry to keep coming back to this, but they have their own problems and their own issues, and they'll tell me, this is the story. And I'm going, but that's not what I heard. That's not what they told me. I don't care. That's the story you're doing. What do you have to fight that? Uh, yes. that? It happens. I mean, a dirty little secret number 10 for the day so far, I guess, <laughs> is this, is that we talk about how we're writing for the public or producing radio shows for the public or doing TV for the public, and of course that's true. But for most people, for the peons like me, as opposed to executive producers, we're actually, we're actually working for editors. The first people we have to sell the story to, the first people we have to make the story sing to is editors because if we don't do that it never gets in the air or on the air or in the paper right and let me tell you how that actually works because I just had a flashback yesterday having stopped doing this two years ago I, I'm uh, pitching a piece for the weekend edition of the Toronto Star on the square kilometer array radio telescope um, which is a fairly complex thing since it cost 2.5 billion dollars uh, and I was asked by the editor before he went into the weekly meeting to give him 35 words 35 words explaining why this story should be in the weekend paper and that that's quite common I mean at the star and at most major newspapers and certainly at all wire services that's called a sked line and 35 is a quite long one actually normally you have to do them in about 25 that's how what you have to do because you're selling it to the editor and if you can't condense it into that few words almost the headline which I think is going to be something like unraveling the mysteries of the cosmic symphony um, then you, you won't get past that stage. That's, that's the dirty little secret. We're really first concerned with editors, then with the public. Now, editors aren't stupid. If you've got something that's really good for the public, they're going to buy it, right? But you first have to sell it to them. Wrong. You're spring. No, no, you're going po to poise. You're poised. I don't know any reporters who set out to tell a lie. I'm getting back to that again, all right? But they have been, it, it's a sad truth, that they have been trapped in the this is the story uh, uh, maelstrom, uh, the, the cyclone. And there's nothing they can do about it. There really is nothing they can do about it. And, and what do you do about it on your side? My gosh. Oh, you know what? You just have to be honest and, and tell your truth. Uh, if, if I'm a reporter and I want you to tell me something that is patently not true, that it goes directly against what your research is talking about, then don't do it. Refuse to do it. Tell me to go away. I wish more people would do that. Not me. Last question, and then we'll break for coffee uh, or tea or whatever. So you mentioned like you considered that only twenty percent of the population was, was science aware. Not, 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 I quoted the National Science Foundation. Uh, Actually, yeah, so had sources. In, in, uh, over the, the past like you know ten years, I've, I've done a number of uh, science demonstrations going into school, and invariably I find almost a hundred percent of kids are interested in science. So where are we losing those 80% and whose job is it to make sure we don't do it? Well, it's a little bit outside the ambit of this panel, but let me point you to the website of the Canada Foundation for Innovation where you will find the CFI Youth Science Monitor, which surveys 2,600 st students in Canada, age 12 to 16, and charts their interest in science throughout that period and we're losing them somewhere around grade nine, 10 basically and we lose them at different rates in different fields and different genders and all sorts of things and there's actually differences between provinces as well. Why we're losing them the survey suggests would be um, the quality of teaching most, most important particularly in the even in the seven eight grades because many people who teach in the seven, eight grades are themselves scared shitless of science, right? I mean, they, they're humanities graduates, they're art graduates. Suddenly they're told they have to teach three modules on this or four modules on this, so they're just this far ahead in the, in the book, right? I mean, my, hearts go out to them. my heart goes out to them, right? Uh, the second is in parental involvement. 
there's, I hate to say it, but if you look at it, you can spot cultural differences in the students who remain interested in science, and it tends to be the ones whose parents are in fact, re take, take a look, who, who, they, who say that their parents take a direct interest in what they're doing. The degree of, there's, it's a linear, it's almost linear, the degree of parental involvement and the degree of stick to if you want to call it that, tenacity, uh, are almost direct. And then there are a couple of other factors. But you can download the re report from the, either the Ipsos Read website or the uh, Canada Foundation for Innovation website. It's called the CFI Youth Science Monitor, published in June. I was the coordinator, which is, you walked right into my trap, you know I mean? <laughs> We're going to break, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. I've got a simpler answer. I blame it entirely on grade nine chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 15 minutes, please, folks. Short announcement to make, which is that when it says on the program that 410 that there are drinks, that's to indicate wine and cheese, not just coffee and other things like that. Alcoholic beverages will be served. But you can't get any until you fill up the response form at the back of the sheet of pages you have. That's the price you have to pay. So I'm going to turn it over to you now, sir. Okay. Richard's bio is in the program, by the way. Okay, thanks. I'll just hang on to this one because I've got to uh, exchange it for the video near the end and put this here. Um, uh, take the lens cover off and uh, we can there we go so um, I guess I come along because when uh, Jim asked who'd been interviewed on quirks and quarks I, w I guess I was the only hand that got put up um, no, who's, it's who's one of the good interviews on yes. quirks yeah, <laughs> <not just. laughs> so anyway um, um, and I guess I'm here completely because of Jim, because uh, Peter phoned me up and asked, uh, um, you know, are you available? Um, and I was recommended by Jim, so I guess I did something that wasn't too bad when I was on, on Quarks and Quarks. Um, anyway, I'm, I'm sort of here because I do science, because I've tried to make it accessible to uh, some people. And hopefully, um, you know, I've picked up a few things that, that might be of some help. Um, let's see here. So I, I've just got up there some of the things that are in my, my CV. The first couple on there, the sleeping for space. Actually, what Jim said isn't quite true, or at least it wasn't true then, because it wasn't published work. It was a work in progress at the time. We, it was cool. It was. We had 24 women who spent 60 days in bed continuously. They didn't get up for anything. They went to the bathroom in a slight head down position. They showered in a head down position. They stayed in that head down position for 60 days. Why? Because it simulated long duration space flight. And we were fortunate enough to be really heavily involved in terms of doing a whole bunch of measurements on, on these people. Um, the next time, feigning astronauts on Quirks and Quarks. Uh, we finally got our first astronaut into space. And this was after about close to seven years from start of experiment to him actually launching because we had the, uh, uh, the Columbia accident in between and all sorts of other things that slow science down when you're trying to deal, um, when you're trying to do astronaut research. Um, Discovery Channel interview just about the same time, right, well, it was actually immediately after the landing of our first astronaut. Um, we had a chance to, uh, to do that. Um, Jay Ingram at that time was in his studio and I was over in my lab and we had a guy with a camera in there and, uh, um, you know, trying to do some shots and long range interview and so on. It worked reasonably well. Um, a couple of uh, websites and so on, and a Globe article. Um, the Globe is a really neat article when you, uh, when you can get it and you get, let's see, this is uh, 
the online version. Um, the thing I didn't say a second ago is that, yes, we do research with astronauts, but do you know the kind of neat thing about astronauts is that they get older faster when they go into space. And the other part, or another major part of what I do in research is looking at old people, how their cardiovascular systems age. So what I've been able to do is tie together the astronaut story, which is really cool, with aging, which is everybody, and bring that, that, those two things together and, and you know, generally try to make a, a, a story out of it. So this is, you know, this was on the, uh, the website and uh, the, um, the interviewer came over to the um, long-term care retirement facility over in Guelph where I was doing a talk and um, talked to a whole bunch of the residents as well as to me and, you know, it was really a, a, a pretty neat st story. Um, a few other things that ended up in various uh, locations. The one thing I'm going to show you just a little bit later on is the outcome, very bad dot, the outcome of this um, press conference that was at the Ontario Science Centre and followed up with an interview on, uh, on the Daily Planet. I'll show you that in just a couple seconds. And again, one of the things that, that really came across is this link from the um, the, the astronauts to the aging to keeping fit and healthy and that's the message that I've tried to convey um, to um, through all of these different stories so this was in a, a picture that was from the uh, from the KW record okay I said we study astronauts well it's really cool stuff it's really something that hey I can identify with you know seeing an astronaut or or something but you know how many of us are going to be astronauts not very many Bob Thirsk the guy in blue there um, spent six months up on ISS just recently and this is a picture of me running with him back in April 2009 uh, we were in Moscow uh, in Star City actually just outside of Moscow that's a statue of Yuri Gagarin there and um, Bob and I are running in the, the remnants of the snow um, the, the reason I'm showing you this is that this is the title slide I used when I went around and talked as a member of the, like our Research Institute for Aging is associated with a total of 10 retirement long-term care facilities across Ontario. And I went to the eight of them that were open and did this presentation. So um, it was earlier suggested that you talk to a five-year-old. Well, it's the same thing if you talk to an 80 or a 90 year old. You have to make the story simple. And believe me, this was the most valuable thing I could have done before I got on the Daily Planet. Because I had to practice over and over saying these things in nice simple terms that got these older people really excited and they had to understand what I was doing and why I was doing it. So we went around to these uh, uh, I went around to these retirement facilities and, you know, was able to, to practice my spiel um, with, with them. And it's really neat. You can get all these pictures of astronauts and show them taking the Soyuz out on, on the train out to the launch pad and a picture of Bob standing up there uh, waving to the crowd. He's on the top and then the, um, the Belgian and a Russian cosmonaut are, are on the lower steps there. That was the day that they were launching on May 27th. And when Bob came back from space, of course, there was, you know, a lot of um, uh, good Canadian press. And uh, shortly after he, or, well, sorry, while, while he was up there is when we did the, um, uh, some of the interviews. So what I'm going to do is I've got two video clips and I guess I'm sort of the, um, the sacrificial lamb here, the person who uh, you get to look at what a fool I made of myself and see whether or not there's some things that are in there that, you know, that are worthwhile. The, um, the, the first interview is uh, from CTV and so
So if you can just sort of pull it up and just pause it for a second while I introduce a little bit more. Uh, it's the VTS one. You've got it open down the bottom right there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so CTV has a uh, local Kitchener station has done this really great series on health and lifestyle and Leslie Gordon um, was, would go out and interview various people. She'd spend a couple of hours with you and condense it down to two minutes. So, you know, hopefully out of all the, that couple of hours you've, you've said something that's really good and, and uh, you know, she really wants to hear. Um, she and many of the other uh, reporters um, who have this sort of lifestyle bent uh, Kelly Crow from CBC is the same same kind of a person who has this specific bent on how she wants um, you know what kind of messages she thinks the public want to hear and has enough knowledge that, that they can pull it together um, anyway they do a great job and so uh, I'll just let her go through this it's about two and a half minutes not supposed to be the end of it. Obviously, you got a you got a sense of what was going on there. Um, hopefully, the next uh, clip will play though, and it's a um, yeah the the Daily Planet one. Um, this let me let me just introduce it before you start it. Um, this, as I said, came from the uh, an out, outshoot of the press conference that was going on. They had Bob Thirsk spinning around up there, um, being interviewed from the ground. And I went along as sort of the person who tried to introduce to the press who were there what, um, what our experiment CSIS was all about. And, um, well, there, yeah, I mean, Jay does a, a, a pretty good job of getting a sense of what the story is about, as you heard a little while ago. Um, but he's got his own vision on what that story is going to be. He also gets told by someone who you are. So there, were, there are three things in here that I want you to notice. First, he, inter he introduces me off the top as from the Department of Kinesiology. Well, <clears throat> I, I hate to say it, but I don't know what the heck kinesiology is, and I'm not a kinesiologist. just happen to be in a department that's called that. So at the end of it, he calls me from the Depart or Faculty of Applied Health Sciences, which is much nicer. Um, the other thing, he starts talking about um, what are, what's Bob doing up in space. Well, what Bob was doing up in space was sort of this much of science, and what we were doing on the ground was this much. So, you know, I sort of quickly steered him off into the direction that I wanted him to go in terms of talking about that. And there's one other thing that I'll probably remember when I watch it, but anyway, just, just go ahead and watch and, and see what happens. Center. We're going to 
wake up with the ISS soon and talk to Bob Thirks, Canadian astronaut who's on a six-month mission aboard the ISS. While he's up there, there are physiological experiments being done with Bob, and they're being led by Dr. Richard Houston, who's with me here. He's a professor of kinesiology at the University of Waterloo. So that was really fascinating. So what sorts of things are you doing with Bob? Well, the things that we're doing with Bob while he's up in flight uh, are just simply putting on some heart rate monitors, some activity monitors, and then we measure his blood pressure and heart rate relationships to try to understand how blood pressure is being controlled. But before and after flight, we do a really detailed experiment that looks in, in much more detail at what, what's happening to the cardiovascular system, how you're getting blood back to the heart, and how you're pumping blood out from the heart and maintaining the, the absolutely necessary blood flow up to the brain. So now, why is it so important to do that incredibly detailed stuff before and after? The uh, problem is you can't do it on the space station. It's just too complex. You need, well, we have a team of four scientists who go uh, to the pre-flight measurement and we'll be in Russia as soon as Bob gets back and we'll do the post-flight measurement on him there. So it just can't be done on the space station. So then what you're doing on the space station, you hope, uh, given this much more detailed body of knowledge, you'll be able to interpret that. So yes, exactly. That's sort of the bridge between the, the really detailed stuff. So when we're measuring the heart rate and blood pressure control on the space station, right. um, that's the best we can do up there because that's the availability of the equipment and the availability of the time. But it's that bridge that hopefully connects the real detailed dots on either end. Do, do you have much information to date about what happens to astronauts on long-term flights like this in terms of blood pressure and cardiovascular? Yeah. Well, you know, this, this experiment was started eight years ago. And it, it takes a long time. We have the accident in the middle and, and so on. Um, when we started the experiment, our, our, our hypothesis was that people would have trouble regulating their blood pressure and they'd be much more likely to think when they come back. That's partially true, but boy, those guys are doing a fantastic job up there right now. Lots of exercise and keeping themselves fit and healthy so that when they come back and we do our experiments, we're seeing really tiny changes in the heart rate and blood pressure control mechanism. So is exercise the key? It, it's a major, major key. The fact that they have two hours a day set, up, set aside where they can run on the treadmill or the cycle or on their exercise device, you know, the fact that, you know, Bob has this get fit for space program that he started before he went up there. And that's absolutely essential. He's doing a great job of keeping himself fit and healthy. We expect that as soon as he comes back, his blood pressure control is going to look rock solid and, you know, he'll be able to get up and walk around. That's it. Now, I know that not all research done in space is applicable to life on Earth, but if you think about something that seems to me to be fairly straightforward, exercise helps control blood pressure, can you apply that on Earth? Well, it's the whole cardiovascular fitness thing. It's not just blood pressure, it's the you know, fitness required for daily life. And our sedentary lifestyles right now, unless we specifically add exercise into them, we're going to lose fitness and our bodies are going to go down and um, The thing about the space station is they go down and much, much faster unless they're exercising because they have no gravity to work against up there. At least here, you know, the sedentary... We have a little bit of work whether we like it or not. Exactly, yeah. A sedentary person getting up to go walk to the refrigerator. At least they're doing a little bit of work. But that's, that's, the, that's, only, not that's the best justification I've ever heard for going to the fridge. Yeah, it's not enough. <laughs> yeah, you definitely have to do specific exercise to keep yourself fit and healthy. Well, it'll be fascinating to see if when Bob returns in a, in a few weeks' time that he's in, in as good shape as you think. Thanks a lot. Okay. Nice to talk to you. All right. Dr. Okay. Richard Houston, can... professor in the Faculty of Applied Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo. Now, okay. I'm going to go and talk to Bob Thurston himself. Yes. Okay. So. So um, that's sort of um, everything. I guess I sort of <laughs> bared my soul there. Um, but um, I guess I don't know how this part is running. Do you, you take want? Some questions? I will take some questions. All right, let's see if there are questions. You said you thought there might be something you'd think of inside. Yeah, it was just the. It was just that important message about fitness and health and exercise. So. Which you got to pick up. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. your, your research was cool and relevant, but it wasn't published. How did you get that message out <laughs> to groups and quirks and daily planet? Um, the, the Canadian Space Agency really is the, the yeah. major source of it. Mm -hmm. and they, um, 
why do you do this? Why do you put so much effort? You clearly are putting a lot of effort in going there and setting up and thinking about it and preparing. Why, why, why do you care? Why do you do this? Actually, I do have one. What is it? One more slide here. Some thoughts. Um, <laughs> science is important to everyone. And it's, it's really important, I believe, to get that message across because we have to justify the money that we're spending. Um, you know, to, to send some, the Canadian space program is extremely expensive. Um, CIHR and NSERC, all those programs are extremely expensive. And if the Canadian public doesn't get the message across that, it, you know, it, that you're doing something really useful, that it's something that they can get some benefit from, such as, well, that link between astronauts aging and all of us aging. Um, I mean, that's my little chunk of the message, and I keep hammering away at it. Have you been burned? Have you had bad experiences? No, I've never had a bad experience. I've had sort of, eh, experiences, but, but never a, a bad one. Um, you haven't met the 5% that Rob was talking about? No, I, <laughs> fortunately I've stayed away from them. So. Over there. Since you made that comment, I've, been, I've had that experience. When I was called about commenting on black crossing with black colors, basically they, they, well, the journalist had already an idea, but he wanted to get a, I opened a door and just walked right to it. Headlines, and then I was called by, by my partner to say, what are you doing? Yeah. You gotta be very careful what you say. Especially people have, have an agenda, yes, mm -hmm. of course. But the distinction here is that not all journalists have an agenda. In fact, it would be the very, 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 very small minority. You don't have an agenda, but you have a, a slant where you want yeah, to. Yeah, twist, twist, twist. Twist. But here's living proof. Go ahead, sir. Uh, I just wanted to add um, there are strategies, tactics, and approaches that can be taken to. Increase or decrease the likelihood of happening, of having happened with, with right. I'm going to cover them. Have been raised already. Uh, qualifying the interview, ask questions before you agree to do it, and so forth. So, uh, well, I did remember yesterday. Yeah, and if you want to. I'm going to, I'm going to cover those at the end in that tip section. The strategies are going to be used. Other questions? Other comments? Okay. I just want to say something so that you were touching on here. So you were doing an interview with with something like Daily Planet, for example, exactly right. Jay hadn't talked to you first. So the person who's calling is going to be the producer. The producer has um, talked to the scientists first and has their own idea of the way the interview should go. And you, you know, as you say, you've got to kind of, you're stuck in a live situation there and you are, at, Usually, as people, we just try to make things easier for the other person. So if they make a mistake, you kind of have to make the judgment of, do I fight them on this one? No, I, that's not my title. Sorry, it's wrong. Well, no, it's not worth it at this point. But afterwards, you can go back and say, just make sure um, this is my title and this is how I should be addressed so that the Chiron underneath, like that font underneath, of course, was correct and, and Jay picked it up. But um, also, knowing that you're going to go into a five-minute interview, knowing, kind of loud up there. <laughs> knowing what it is you want to say, and you knew mm -hmm. what you wanted to say, so that even if the questions didn't go the way that you would have expected them, you knew what you wanted to get out of it. Uh, out of the interview, and that mm -hmm. is being prepared and practicing, practice, practice. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm very uncomfortable with a camera shoved in my face, and I don't think I'll ever be comfortable doing that. I don't mind standing talking to someone when the camera's over there. That's that's not as bad, but it, but it it, it is intimidating, and it's it's definitely something you got to practice. And if you really want to get good at it. You should probably get your camera and stick it in front of your face and talk to it, which Last creeps me out. Yeah, I, it, and Lane raises a really good question, which I hope, by the way, if I may, I hope I haven't done a disservice today. I had a couple of people talk to me uh, during the break about why would I step out and, and put myself out there uh, to a news report? 
why would I do that? Uh, given uh, oh, horror stories I told you today. Um, and I can't answer that. I'm hoping maybe, maybe Jim can contribute to this. Why would you do that? Why would you step out there? For a news reporter, it is essentially it's to clarify the story, to validate the story. I need that information from him. I'm hoping that you will step in front of the camera. And I would want you to step in front of the camera or, or in, in the telephone or the microphone or whatever. Um, so let me, let me, can I quickly throw that out? I, I had, I wasn't able to give an adequate response. Well, you answered it in part, I think, the importance of, of uh, yeah, informing the public. But, but, but not everybody, uh, not every researcher needs to validate what they are by going on the media. They're, they're published, they're, they're in the, the papers, the papers are published, they certainly don't have to sit in front of the media. They're a CRC. Jim? I'll just give my answer to that. I think there's, from my perspective, there's two reasons why you need to speak to the media, which is speaking to the public. Number one, the public funds most of what you do. And I think um, I think Richard did allude to that. But I think the public needs to understand where that money's going, whether it's the space station or to universities or to the research chairs. The public pays your salaries. They pay for your research. I think you have a, a, a moral obligation to tell them Tell the public where their money's going, why it matters, and what you're doing with it. Secondly, I think science has a huge impact on public policy. And I think that too often scientists, um, uh, the book that Peter pointed out called Escape from the Ivory Tower, which I did contribute to that book, um, uh, too often scientists and researchers do hide in the Ivory Tower. They don't want to engage the public. They don't want to engage with public policy. And I think that that has huge impacts uh, on our society. You could just look at an area like climate change where too many of the climate scientists stood back, let the deniers take control of the public agenda, confused the public, public came to understand that the science was divided and unsettled, but in fact the science was solid and completely uh, validated, and yet and that led to a paralysis of public policy on climate change with huge impacts for our lives, our planet, our society. So I think engaging with the media and the public is absolutely an obligation, and I think it's something that all scientists should and must do. Well said. One more, one more, one more. Yes, but I also think um, it's part of an outreach, um, more than just to the public, it's also to the youth and to the kids who are going to study science. I think if reading science, it's very different from seeing someone get excited about it and talk about it and make it sound exciting. And, and that's what comes across when, when Richard talks on his interview, and that's what we hope most of us can bring to it, is, is some excitement and some feeling that, that yes, this might be worth doing. Uh, and that doesn't come across from reading, reading a science paper. So. Thank you very okay. much.